Welcome to episode 212 of Real Health Radio. You can find the show notes and the link talked about as part of this episode at 7, so the word all spelled out, S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 212. For the last handful of weeks, I've been starting the show talking about the fact that 7 Health is taking on new clients. And at the time of recording this intro, which is uh, a couple of weeks prior to this actually airing, more than half the spots are gone. So client work is the core of the business, the core of 7 Health, and it's the thing I actually enjoy the most. And after working with clients for more than a decade, I feel confident in saying I'm very good at what I do. And when I reflect on the clients that have sought out 7 Health over the last couple of years, there's a handful of areas that really come up the most. So one of the biggest is helping women get their periods back, so recovery from hypothalamic amenorrhea or HA, and this is often the result of under-eating and over-exercising and is almost always connected with a fear of gaining weight and a focus on being healthy. I've had clients regain their period after being absent for 10 or even 20 years often after being told it would never happen again, or clients becoming pregnant who'd almost given up hope of it happening. We also work with clients along the disordered eating and eating disorder spectrum, and many clients wouldn't think to use the term disordered eating to describe themselves. They just know that things aren't right. And with these clients, there are symptoms that are commonly occurring. So water retention, poor digestion, always cold, peeing all the time, uh, often waking multiple times in the night, and no periods or bad PMS symptoms, low energy, poor sleep, low thyroid. And there's also common mental and emotional symptoms. So compulsion to exercise or a fear of certain foods, anxiety, uh, low mood or depression, poor body image and, and fear of weight gain. And at Seven Health, we believe in full recovery. We've had many clients who've had multiple stays at inpatient facilities where nothing worked but through working together, they've got to a place of full recovery. Many clients also come to Seven Health as they want help transitioning out of dieting and so they can start to finally listen to their body. They've had years or decades of dieting and just know that nothing works, but they're really just figuring out or struggling to figure out how to eat without dieting. And then many clients also experience feelings of body shame and hatred and they're determined to be a particular size and feel frustrated um, or even angry by what they see in the mirror. And they want to get past this and be able to be present in their life and stop putting things on hold. And in all of these scenarios, we use the core components of what Seven Health is about, which is science and compassion. We focus on both physiology and psychology, so understanding how the body works and how best to support it, but also understanding the mental and emotional side and uncovering someone's identity and values and priorities and traits and beliefs and how these can be either helping or hindering change. So it's these kinds of clients that make up the bulk of the practice and I'm very good at helping people get to the place where their food and their body and even their life, that feels out of reach. So if any of these scenarios sound like you and you'd like help, then please get in contact you can head over to 7-health.com forward slash help and you can read about how we work with clients and apply for a free initial chat. This will be the last time we're starting with clients in 2020. And as I said at the start, we're over half the spots are already gone. So if you're wanting help, then please reach out. The link again is 7-health.com forward slash help and I'll also include that in the show notes. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. I'm your host, Chris Sandal. So this week on the show, it is another guest interview, and my guest today is Emily Fonsbeck. Emily is a registered dietitian who owns her own private practice in Hyde Park, Utah, working with both local and virtual clients. She specializes in treating eating disorders, disordered eating, body image concerns, and accompanying issues. She's also the co-owner of the Eat Confident Collective, where she offers group coaching programs for women struggling with food and body image. She also co-hosts the Eat With Confidence podcast. Emily is passionate about helping individuals create a peaceful relationship with food and their body, building confidence in their own natural ability to know how to eat. So I've been following Emily's work for a couple of years now. I first came across her on 
someone's podcast. It might have been Christy Harrison's and then have subsequently kept up with what she's been doing, <laughs> which is a lot. And so I finally reached out to her and, and got her to come on the show. A big focus of this episode is about orthorexia. So this is something that Emily dealt with herself for seven or eight years. And so she knows the experience of this firsthand. So we go through her story with it and her recovery journey, as well as talking more broadly about orthorexia with this both sharing our insights from working with clients. We talk about Emily's work in the early part of her career at a weight loss resort and that while she's pretty steadfastly against this now, it was actually an experience that helped her see the futility of weight loss and helped her to get into intuitive eating and a weight neutral and non-diet approach. We chat about infertility and Emily's personal experience in this area. And we also talk about feeding children and how this has changed for her as she left her orthorexia behind. So I really love this conversation. It felt like it could have gone on for hours more. So I hope you find it helpful. Here is me chatting with Emily Fonsbeck. Hey, Emily, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So yeah, I'm really excited to have you here. And when preparing for you to come on and going through your blog and Instagram and the podcast, like there, there really is so much that I want to cover. Uh, orthorexia is definitely a big topic that I want to spend some time on. Um, maybe fertility as well, as I know that can be a struggle for, for many listeners and yeah, lots more. So yeah, let's just see where the conversation goes. But to start off with, do you want to give listeners a bit of background on yourself, who you are, what you do, what training you've done, that sort of thing? Sure. That's great. Well, my name is Emily Fonsbeck. I'm a registered dietitian. I live in the United States. We live in just Northern Utah. We're right on the Idaho border actually. Um, I live with my husband and our four kids, and uh, I've been practicing now for, I guess, going on 16 years. Um, I started, you know, newly out of uh, school as a student and newly registered dietitian. I started actually practicing at a weight loss resort, and that was such a good experience, obviously very different from the way that I practice now. Um, as you know, currently working with eating disorders, disordered eating and body image from a non-diet weight neutral approach. It's definitely um, obviously evolved a lot over the years, but in large part because of that, because I started at a weight loss resort where I was able to um, observe the behaviors and beliefs of a lot of these people who were coming to stay for weeks, um, sometimes months at a time. And just recognizing that the way that I was practicing, which I'd been taught in school, of course, to use BMI to measure health and to cut people's calories if they didn't meet a quote unquote normal BMI and, and to put people on diets. And that's just kind of the way that I had learned how to practice as a dietitian. And I saw that I was actually probably part of the problem, not the solution. <laughs> yeah, And that was troubling to me, but it was so good to be in that really uncomfortable place to have to unlearn so much of what isn't helpful and to learn new ways of really helping people come to a place of peace and confidence with food in their body um, that isn't dependent on, on diets or weight loss. And so observing uh, you know, listening and learning from them was big for me and a huge part of my transition out of a diet focused approach into something that is a lot more supportive of just, you know, trusting your body and listening to what it says and, and uh, having more flexible eating patterns. And, uh, when I left there, I started my own private practice, which is a, it was good timing to be able to kind of switch that treatment approach and to be able to help in the way that I wanted to help. And as I mentioned, particularly focusing on eating disorder recovery. And so with, I mean, you said that working at the, the resort, the weight loss resort has provided some benefits in, in terms of you now seeing things in a really different light. How long did it take for you to reach that new conclusion? Because my, my thought would be as you being a new dietitian, initially you must have been 
and, and I don't want to make assumptions, so you correct me if I'm wrong here, but you must have been making the thought of like, okay, I think I'm doing something wrong. Like maybe this is something lacking within me if these people aren't getting these results. Is, is that how it first started out? Yeah, that's very fair to say. You know, I just, I think it's very easy to question yourself rather than questioning the method or the approach. Like I just need to get better at this um, approach in order to really help them meet their goals. I think that's really common in weight loss, particularly, right? If people aren't getting the the goal, the, achieving the goals that they want to achieve, it, very often that comes back on the provider of them just not doing a good enough job. Um, and so it was very eye opening and very helpful for me to realize that the odds are against me. <laughs> if I'm going to uh, focus on intentional weight loss, statistically the odds are against the provider and the patient in terms of being able to be successful in that way, especially long-term. And, and so, yeah, I think that's really fair to say. And, and so important that we recognize that, that it's the method that's flawed or the approach that's flawed, not the, not the provider and not the patient. And maybe we need to use different therapeutic approaches to truly help the patient um, be able to overcome whatever struggles that they're having. You know, I think a really good example of that is, um, you know, the thing that really opened my eyes the most, I guess I should say at the resort is how many people coming into the resort could actually meet diagnostic criteria for binge eating disorder and actually really needed to be in eating disorder treatment, not at a weight loss resort. And that was, that awareness was life changing for me. I really started to recognize that as you, as you were mentioning, like it's not the method that was flawed. It was the, or it was the method that was flawed, not the, per, not the, the, not me or the patient, not me or the guest. It yeah. was just the method. And so yes, exactly. Really coming to understand the, the research behind weight loss and diets and statistically how it's really not in favor of uh, sustained weight loss and to be able to know that there is a different approach and, and really, you know, as in my mind, being able to switch that from this isn't, this isn't their problem. They need a different solution, right? They need to be in treatment for, for an eating disorder. They don't need to be in treatment for weight loss. Yeah. And I think as well, maybe recognizing that was helpful because, and again, you, you tell me if this was the case, a lot of the time when people do go in for weight loss, it can work in the short term. So they come to the resort, it works in inverted commas, they then leave, and then you don't necessarily see the aftermath. And so you could be feeling like you're getting success, but if you're then seeing this other Thing while they're there of, okay, actually these guys are meeting the requirement for binge eating disorder, that can sort of add an extra layer of uh, kind of breaking through that mirage of this is working. Yeah. And it was actually really interesting because we got a lot of repeat guests. I mean, that was very normal for guests to leave and come back because they couldn't do it at home is kind of their, their wording. And to see the shame that was really operating under the surface there of I'm flawed, I'm broken. I can't continue this at home or I can't, I can't create long lasting sustainability with this. This must be my fault. Right. Yeah. And all of the shame that's operating under the surface there. And so at what, like how long did it then take for you to then somewhat see the light? And, and while you were there, were there other people that you could confide in where you're, you're, where you're starting to have this ambivalence around um, how you're seeing it unfold? Well, it was interesting because, you know, I, I felt actually very well respected and appreciated by the owners and they always, they really, um, I always felt supported by them. And so I was able to actually discuss these concerns with them and talk about kind of the concerns that I was, I was, I was seeing. I don't think that they, um, I don't think that they had the life experiences or the perspective that really allowed them to see this for what it was. They were always open to discussion. And I think that they felt like they were actually doing you know, well, okay, so eating disorder recovery can also include weight loss, can't it? <laughs> and so I, I think it was just a lot of cognitive dissonance in that way. 
Um, but eventually it just kind of ran its course. It, it was, it just became really hard for me to be there and very difficult to continue, um, to continue working there, even though they gave me a lot of freedom to teach the things I wanted to, to teach, like intuitive eating, like the concern with fixation on weight. I mean, I was able to teach a lot of those things as I taught classes there and, and whatnot. And they were very open to those kinds of conversations and exposing guests to, you know, different perspectives and ideas around weight and around food. And so I definitely had freedom of license to teach those things. It just was difficult. Um, it felt, um, I guess the best word for it would be a little bit of gaslighting. Like the, the ultimate goal that they were there for was to lose weight. And then I was kind of talking about intuitive eating in this way that I don't, I don't think my message was that it's a tool for weight loss, but of course they're there and learning about intuitive eating at a weight loss resort. And it just really got muddled. You know, it got messy. The messages got really messy. So the time came that it just had run its course and I appreciate my time there and I appreciated my time there, but it was time to move on. That was about, I guess, six years into my career when I decided to transition into private practice, which I've now been in for the last 10 years. And Oh, it was such, such a relief to be able to transition to a place where I did really have um, a little bit more ownership over the way that I wanted to help people. Yeah. And I want to spend some time to the chatting about that piece, but I also want to go back to earlier on for you. So, so starting with your childhood and growing up and like, how was food in, in your home? That's a great question. And one that I've really reflected a lot on over the years, especially because I think, um, I sh I'm sure Chris, you agree with this, you know, it's very eye opening and therapeutic for any of our clients to do the same, to assess what their relationship with food and, and body image was like growing up because so much of our adult behaviors could probably be linked to our childhood upbringing and beliefs that were formed at that time. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And to be quite honest, I think I grew up in a fairly safe environment. I was, um, you know, looking back, I can actually see that perhaps my mom was kind of dieting under the radar, but it was never something that she talked overtly about. And we didn't label food as good and bad. It just was food, which was my mom uh, worked full time as a school teacher all I, while I was growing up, but she still cooked dinner every night. We ate dinner together as a family. They were always home cooked meals. There wasn't anything. They were just very normal meals with inclusive of lots of different kinds of foods. And it, I, I don't think that, um, I really didn't grow up in a weight or food obsessive environment at all. My interest in becoming a dietitian was actually linked to my interest in running and just trying to understand how to best fuel myself for best performance. And it was a very positive thing. It was my interest in nutrition really started out very positively and just wanting to fuel myself well, make sure I'm eating enough and eating adequately and eating often enough in order to um, perform in the way that I wanted to perform. So that's where my interest grew. I and, and at bought, what age did you get into running? My high school years, probably okay. starting at the age of 15 or 16. So okay. yeah, my my high school years were, I was, I was a little bit more interested in running and, and became more interested in nutrition, but not in the way of like restricting or cutting out foods, but just you know, how this felt, like how, you know, how much I needed to eat in order to run as well as I could. And it sounds like you had a good household growing up in terms of food and the messaging you got around food. What about with the coaching in terms of running? Was, was there anything not great about the advice that you received through that? No, not at all. And I think that that's um, not common from what I understand now, yeah. but my my situation was, was not that, you know, it was more about performance and, and eating enough and eating well. And I'm sure words like healthy were used. And at the time that wasn't, you know, healthy wasn't such a loaded term <laughs> as I think it often becomes for people when they've struggled with food. Yeah. Um, I think I had a more flexible flexible view on what healthy eating was. So to be able to hear the term eating healthy 
uh, that translated to something that felt really normal and natural and flexible to me, not something that felt restrictive. Yeah, definitely. And so with your teenage years, was there any dieting? Like I, I know you said you grew up in this household where that wasn't pushed by your parents, but from chatting with so many guests and, and so many clients, sometimes there is that camaraderie that comes about for um, kids when they're, when they're in their teenage years of going on diets with friends so was there, or, or with siblings. So was there any of that going on? Yeah, that's actually really interesting. I have thought about that. I did have friends that would try different diets and different eating protocols. And I remember thinking it was crazy. I remember at the time thinking like, why would you do that? Like, why? (laughs) Like, why would you starve yourself like that? Or why would you only eat that one food all day or only drink water? Like, I, I just, in my mind, it just didn't really make sense. It didn't feel logical to me. Um, And I think a lot of that was because I always felt pretty comfortable around food. I felt pretty comfortable. I think I was naturally um, pretty good at knowing when I was hungry and being able to stop when I was full. And I didn't really have a fixation on food. And I feel like I was able to to think pretty flexibly about it. And so to hear those kinds of messages, it just really didn't make sense to me at the time. Right. And so when you were thinking about what am I going to study and and the idea of being a dietitian came up, what did you think you would be doing or what was the bits that were really pulling you towards that profession? Well, I think it started out selfishly, right? As I mentioned, I wanted to learn more about nutrition for myself. Um, When I became interested in dietetics, um, I took a a nutrition course my first semester of college and also started shadowing dietitians at the local hospital and really loved the class and very much enjoyed the work that I did at the hospital, which is interesting now because of course it's clinical work and was the very last thing I wanted to do after my internship and graduation. I did not want to work in clinical, but that's actually how it started. I I really love science. So going into a health-related field made a lot of sense for me in terms of enjoying the coursework. I really love science. I really love nutrition science. And so it felt like a good fit. I loved the science-y um, aspect of clinical nutrition and calculating tube feedings and all that went into that. I, I found it really fascinating, at least as a student. And so that's what drew me to it, of course, first, just for my own just interest in nutrition, but then it evolved into, I really love the science and I really would love to be able to take this into a clinical setting. And that was my goal all through my undergraduate degree and through my internship until I really did get into it during my internship and, and was practicing as a clinical dietitian and had exposure to other aspects of Uh, being a registered dietitian. And I recognized that that was not what I wanted to do, clinical nutrition, but that is what drew me to the profession in the first place. So then fast forward to after you've left the the weight loss resort and you're setting up your own practice, you'd mentioned that when you were at the resort, you'd been teaching intuitive eating and, and had kind of gone down that road. And so was that really clear in your mind of, okay, this is what I want to be now doing. Yes, absolutely. I think what, you know, six years into my career, what also very much spurred the interest in private practice is not just professionally what I was realizing, but also personally what I was experiencing for myself that I had, I had had, I had my own issues with food and body image. And I realized that I needed a new approach for myself too. And so, you know, those six years had kind of run its course and I needed a change, not just professionally, but personally too. So I I made it through my undergraduate degree in nutrition fairly unscathed. I feel like I very much continued to keep that positive aspect of why I was studying nutrition and what I wanted to do with it uh, well into my coursework and into graduation. And then, um, as a registered dietitian, the requirements are to finish an internship and then pass a registration exam. And I found out that I was pregnant with our first, uh, right when my internship started and it's a 10 month internship. 
And so I, it was a huge surprise and ended up being able to complete the internship, (laughs) prayed every day to be able to finish before I had that baby and ended up having him the day after I finished my internship. Wow. What, What a year. It was a year. It was, and and luckily I had a very easy pregnancy. I was maybe sick at the first, but able to to still perform in my internship, um, and that that was really rewarding. It, I wanted to be able to finish well, and so I'm glad I was able to. But yeah, that was a big transition out of school and working in this internship um, into being a mom. And because it was such a year, because it was such a busy jam-packed year. I didn't prepare myself well for that transition. And from what I know now of eating disorders and how they kind of come about, it was very much the perfect storm of likely my biological and psychological and environmental um, situation that kind of collided to create what became, I think, a coping strategy for myself. I I felt the pressures as many women do postpartum to uh, lose weight and to heal as quickly as possible. And so that compounded with the fact that I felt like life was so out of control. It just was a huge change for me and really um, played into my uh, type A personality that really likes to control food became food in my body came the thing that I can control. And so really I had had such a positive relationship with food up until this point. It wasn't like there was a lot of red flags or big concerns with exercise or food or body image really until I gave birth until there was this huge life event and life change. I felt this pressure. My body had changed. I just given birth and all of a sudden I, I gravitated toward controlling food in my body and it's interesting to see that happen because I, I, don't, I don't know, I hadn't ever used food or body image in that way before, but man, it really, it really, for some reason, became my coping strategy at that time. And with, with it, was it kind of a gradual process? Because I, I see for so many clients that it, it's kind of a slow process or there's this one change that then becomes these two changes and and then six months later or a year later they, they find themselves in in some place but from the way you described it there it, it almost sounded like okay there, there was a gun went off and there was a start line and you just started running in that direction yeah in a lot of ways I do think it escalated pretty quickly I mean I I think essentially what it was is just get back to the gym as soon as possible and I'll just start eating less. I mean, I think it started as move more, eat less because of course that's what I'd learned in order to lose weight. That's what you do. And of course I had, my body had changed with a pregnancy miraculously and perfectly and exactly how it should have. But of course in that moment I saw it as a problem that needed to be fixed. And I, so I think that that was the mentality I took um, I'm very, I'm very goal oriented. And I think my, this is that psychological component where I'm very goal oriented and I have a lot of grit and I, I want to see things through and I finish what I start. And so it, I think that that contributed to this idea of, well, if this is my goal, I'm going to, I'm going to go 110% in. And so if I'm, if I'm supposed to eat more and eat and if I'm supposed to exercise more and eat less, then I'm going to exercise a whole lot more. I need a whole lot less. And I think that's just my personality in general, that psychological um, aspect that contributes to eating disorders. I think that very much put me at risk. So I think, yes, it started with that, but it, I do think it escalated fairly quickly just because of that vulnerability. Um, and so over time, I think, you know, I, I kind of describe it this way. I stayed in, a functionally dysfunctional relationship with food for quite a while. I don't know that I would have labeled it an eating disorder at first, but I, I, I call it functionally dysfunctional because I think it's how a lot of American, a lot of, a lot, I shouldn't say American, a lot of people in the world live with food because yeah. of the culture we live in, because of this mentality of exercise more and eat less. We tend to be at least a little bit fixated or a little bit obsessed or a little bit preoccupied at least a little bit, um, with food and weight. 
And I stayed there for, for quite some time of just being fixated and preoccupied and a bit obsessed. And I think it was easy for me to fly under the radar because I was a nutrition professional. So it was almost expected that I would feel that way or want to focus on those things. Um, but eventually it, it, eventually what happened is the, the effects of exercising too much and eating too little caught up with me. And so I started having symptoms like digestive issues and fatigue and headaches, muscle aches and joint pain, all of these things that really were just because I wasn't fueling my body well enough. Yeah. But in my mind, I attributed that to the fact that I wasn't eating perfectly enough there's something that I was eating that was, you know, inflammatory, which is kind yeah. of a buzzword, pro-inflammatory and problematic. And I needed to figure out what it was and cut it out. And so instead of approaching it as, oh, I have a problem and I need to be eating more and exercising less, I became more strict with food. I it, it started this quest, quest for perfect eating. What exactly was causing my issues? What did I need to cut out? And, and could I eat even more perfectly? So specifically things like sugar and gluten and dairy and all of the very um, villainized foods in wellness culture, the dangerous aspects of wellness culture that really contributed to what I would call a slippery slope into elimination diets. Yeah. And I've, I've seen that so much with, with other clients in terms of that approach of it's got to be something that I'm eating. So if I just pull this thing out or that thing out, then it's going to get better. And it's, it's interesting. You, you say that you were able to fly under the radar because at one sort of end of the spectrum, you're, you're talking about, okay, I never had any of these issues with food. And then I, I clearly did. And I was eating in a different way, but you also said that you were very much goal orientated. So I could understand how then that could muddy the waters a little for someone looking in thinking, okay, maybe she's really got this uh, new idea in mind based on uh, the studies that, that you've done. And for, for like a partner or family, if they were wanting to ask questions or, or were concerned, there's almost this feeling of, well, she studied this for, for X number of years. She's going to be the expert on this. And, and so maybe you were able to, deflect questioning better than someone else because of, because of that ability or because of your, your degree. Yeah. And that's actually exactly kind of the comments that I got after, after I re was recovered from an eating disorder. So many friends and family said to me, Emily, I didn't realize you had a problem. I just I just thought you were super smart, smart and knew what you were doing. I mean, that is exactly the comments that I got. I mean, you, you were a registered dietitian. I just thought you were super smart and knew exactly what you were doing. I didn't realize that it was a problem for you. Now, I, my close family members, I think, were able to observe things that maybe, you know, more distant family or friends maybe didn't observe from a day-to-day -day basis. But yes, exactly that. It might be harder to address eating concerns with a family member or a loved one that has a degree in nutrition or feels like, how do you address that with them? Cause you feel like they should know more than you. And yeah. actually that is exactly what caused so much shame for me in recovery from what eventually became an, an eating disorder, because I felt like I should know what I was doing. How did I let myself get to this place? Right. Yeah. And w at what point or how long did it take to realize for you, okay, this is a problem and this is not good. Because initially it started out as this is my goal, I'm mean, goal orientated, but at some point that went from being functionally dysfunctional to being an eating disorder. But even when it's an eating disorder, there's a lot of people with that going on who are still in the dark and are like, no, this isn't really a problem until there is some point at which they they realize, okay, this is now an issue. So yeah, how long did it take for you to get to that place? Yeah, that's a great question. It took quite a, quite a while because it never would have occurred to me, nor do I even think I wanted to entertain the idea that what I needed was just to eat more. I can look back now and 
think, gosh, how did I miss that? <laughs> right? Like how, <laughs> how did I miss that? What I really needed was just to eat more food. How did I miss that? But it was something that really never crossed my mind that would have never actually felt like a solution. So it took a long time to come to that place. And I'm fairly, um, stubborn and I really like to learn on my own. I just, that's definitely my personality of I'll figure this out. Um, and so I, I think I did have to learn for myself. I really did have to hit rock bottom, not just once, but multiple times to realize that what I was doing was not at all helpful. No matter what anyone else said to me, I needed to know that for myself. I needed to be ready to make that change. And I think that's an important aspect of recovery that I really try to value and keep in mind as I help others now is yeah. that recovery has to be a personal choice. You can't do it for anyone else. It has to be something that you recognize. I no longer want my eating disorder. I don't want it. It's not serving me. It's not helping me anymore. And now I'm ready to let go of it. Yeah. It really has to be a personal choice. And, and so I think that's exactly what started taking place for me over you know, the, the course of years, for sure. I feel like I, you know, the, the elimination diets or cutting foods out in this pursuit of perfect eating was... Uh, it was just that slippery slope into elimination diets. And so I did elimination diet after elimination diet after elimination diet until I was really down to probably a total of five foods that I would allow myself to eat. And of course, you can imagine at that point how malnourished I was and how much I was just not functioning well. And my husband was actually the person who really helped me see that I had a problem and validated that it was a problem and encouraged me to seek help. Um, many times over the years, he... Um, well, I think he did a few things for me. I think ultimately what helped me seek help was he actually produced an article on orthorexia after we'd had kind of a uh, intense conversation one night about my situation. And he said, listen, I think you actually have a problem. I think you have an eating disorder. I don't think the problem is the food. I think it's, it's how you think about food essentially is what he said. And and he produced this article on orthorexia. And I knew the term, but I'd never, ever connected dots to my own situation until then, until I read that article and I was ready to see it for what it is and was ready to seek help. I think it took a lot to get me to that point. And I very much, um, I very much attribute that to him, actually, to my husband. And I'm asked quite a bit about how to support a loved one with an eating disorder. And I definitely have my husband to use in it as an example. He was not trained in any of this. He didn't know what he was doing. Um, and what he did for me, neither of us would have been able to describe or label at the time. But essentially what he did over the years, over the course of years, was he validated and reframed over and over and over again. So he, he helped me feel understood, but he also helped me reframe the situation to, to allow me to get to a place where I could think more flexibly about my situation, where at the first of it, I did, couldn't even think about anything other than it's because I need to eat more perfectly until the end where I was ready to seek help, where I was able to actually hold space for another side of the story. And I really attribute that to him over the course of years, being able to get me to that point. So what I mean by that essentially is validating and reframing. For example, I can understand how confusing your digestive issues are, but I wonder if eating more would help with that. If eating more food would help your digestive tract function better. That's kind of what I mean. He would validate that it was a struggle and that it was confusing and overwhelming, but also help me see another side of the story. And, you know, he has a very, he's, he's very just naturally a very flexible thinker. He's yeah. very relaxed. He's, he's not impulsive. He's not reactive. He's very thoughtful. And I think that that was a huge gift to me, um, where I am, where I was very much reactive and impulsive and, uh, very, my, my brain would get very stuck and fixated. Nice. Yeah. That's amazing that he has that as a, as a skill or, or that feels like it's just his default way of being. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so then I was able to reach out for help because 
for help because of that conversation um, and start the, the process of recovery. And did he then do, was he then doing a lot more reading and researching on orthorexia after that point as well? Like my sense is that you did a lot of reading and researching. And so did, did he want to be helping out even more or once you got into therapy and had someone else who was, who was going to be doing that role, he became a little bit more hands-off on the topic? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think what, uh, as I reflect back over those years, I think what he did really well is letting me own my own story. He never tried to fix. He never tried, he, you know, offer different solutions, um, but he really let me own my own recovery. And I think that he knew my personality because that is my personality of the same the same personality traits that got me into an eating disorder were the very same ones that helped me recover. So being goal oriented, yeah. being, um, you know, very, uh, dedicated to finishing what I start. Once I, once I got on the right track, right. Once he helped me find help, I, I was able to really take over that process of I'm committed to this. I now realize that I have an eating disorder and I'm very committed to recovering from an eating disorder. I don't want it anymore. I'm very willing to do the work and F and it was excruciatingly difficult to recover from. And he was continually supportive. Um, but just, just as I needed to come to that place where I was ready and wanted to change. I think he also respected that it was my journey to walk down and he was, he was there to support, but he wasn't going to do it for me. And I really admire that, right? Because being a spouse to someone who has an eating disorder is so difficult. I know how hard that was for him. In fact, we've had many conversations about how hard he, uh, that was for him. Um, and so I, but essentially it was probably harder for him to stand back and let me do it on my own versus getting overly involved in making yeah. it happen, you know? Yeah, definitely. So I, I'd like to chat a little about orthorexia and you can talk about it from, from your experience, but also we can talk a little more generally just for people who are listening and so like, for you, why did orthorexia feel like it was the, the right label as opposed to, say, anorexia? Well, that, so the reason that I think orthorexia resonated the most with me is because it very much felt more, the focus was more on perfect eating and the quality of the food, not the quantity of the food. Now I realized that I was, I had gotten to a place where I was overly restricted, but it wasn't necessarily because I was afraid of eating too much. It was because I was afraid of not eating perfectly enough and the quality of the food versus the quantity of the food. I also wouldn't have said that it was so much about weight. You know, clearly when I had started postpartum, so much of that was about weight, but it had progressed to something much different at that point. And I think those were the two distinguishing factors that or where orthorexia felt more uh, descriptive of what I was experiencing, experiencing than anorexia. Now in recovery though, from orthorexia, I will say that as weight gain happened and I, as I was eating more, those fears did come up. They did, they did feel more worrisome to me and they did become bigger hurdles in recovery, but I don't know it, it, that it was what motivated the disorder in and of itself. Yeah. And so what would have been your body image uh, prior to recovery? Was that something that was really concerning you um, and something you spent a lot of time thinking about? Or no, it was really only as the changes started to happen that that then kind of forced that front of mind? It's interesting. I don't know that body image pre-recovery was so much about disliking my body more than feeling like I had control of my body. It felt the motivating factor was definitely control, not body dissatisfaction. And so, I mean, I can't say that I didn't fixate on my appearance during, um, during the disorder, for sure. I Definitely that was part of it. 
However, I think it was more just feeling like I needed to control it. I needed to control how it functioned and how it looked. It was very much a control piece. Okay. And what were the things that the, was it, was it a therapist? Was it a practice, like how, the person who helped you, how, how do you describe them? Yeah. So what I, who I'd reached out to was a therapist when I was ready to get help. And it was actually a Saturday night. I'd called her and she, I didn't think would answer, but I was planning on leaving a message just because I was very ready to make a change at that point. And honestly, I didn't know what would come Monday morning. (laughs) You know, how would I feel Monday morning? And so I wanted to take advantage of the time where I felt ready to make a change and felt ready to take action in thinking and and approaching this from a different perspective. And so I, she answered, she answered Saturday night. I set up an appointment for the, actually the following week and we very much connected. I, I, I think I was lucky to find a therapist right off the bat who I felt a connection with, who I felt like a good therapeutic relationship with. And that's who I worked with um, in recovery. What was interesting is I don't, we didn't talk all that much about food. What we very much focused on was my perfectionistic tendencies and worked essentially to overcome that. And in, I think in my heart of hearts knew that if I was able to find alternative coping strategies for the anxiety that I was feeling and was able to let go of my perfectionistic tendencies or to at least find alternative ways of approaching those that I would probably feel more flexible with food. And I was right. So that's, I doesn't, I didn't necessarily unpack a lot of my beliefs around food with anyone because I also felt very shameful about reaching out to a dietitian to help. I don't recommend that, you know, someone in my situation would definitely need a treatment team. It was just very difficult for me to admit to needing a nutrition professional to help me since I was a nutrition professional. And so since I wasn't willing to reach out to someone, I was my own dietitian. Again, I wouldn't recommend this, but I put myself on a meal plan and I challenged my fears around food and I unpacked my own beliefs. And I, I did a lot of the same kinds of therapies with myself that I actually do with clients now. Um, and for some reason I was able to stay somewhat objective with myself and really help myself process and heal and recover Um, and so that's what recovery looked like for me. That's what, that's what therapy looked like. That's what the treatment team looked like for me. Nice. And so what you you said, you did a lot of the things with your food that you now recommend with clients or you think would be good in, in that kind of a relationship. So what, can you go into a bit more detail or give some examples of some of the things that you think would be, would be helpful in a situation like this? Yes, absolutely. So first I think, would be making sure you're eating adequately and regularly. So because I had, I had such haphazard and chaotic eating patterns in terms of eating adequately and regularly, that was something I did change for myself is creating more regular meal times and snack times. And I worked up to something that felt truly adequate, right? Started smaller and worked up to it. That was the first thing. I also did a lot of values based work with myself because essentially what I feel like had happened is the eating disorder had hijacked my values. And I could see that in so many areas of my life. I was a, I was a mom to two young boys who, and I wanted to be, and I wanted to be more engaged and more present in my life and in my, in motherhood. And I valued my faith and I valued so many other things that I wasn't giving attention. I, my whole life had been consumed as is very common with orthorexia by food and perfect eating. And and so I used a lot of values based work to help me reconnect with what I valued. And this is maybe a way to summarize recovery. What you want to do is amplify yourself so that the eating disorder is de-amplified right? Because essentially someone who has an eating disorder is the eating disorder voice. The eating disorder itself is amplified in their life. It's kind of come in and taken over and they've lost themselves. And so in order to heal and recover, you have to amplify yourself. You have to figure out what you want, what you love, what's important to you so that you're not continually hijacked by the eating disorder. And so that's very much, so much of what I did values-based work. And it was incredibly effective for me 
to think about what I wanted to spend time on, the kind of person I wanted to be, the things that were really important to me, and intentionally, regularly shift my focus to those things as a way to amplify myself and deep amplify the eating disorder. Nice. That, I mean, I use values a lot with clients because I, I think you're right. They can help to be this North Star when you're making decisions, when you're reflecting on things. There can be this, okay, is this in alignment with my values? Is this in alignment with either who I am now or who I want to be? And yeah, I think that can be can be really helpful. And also what you said about creating some structure, um, yeah, structure is probably one of the first things and I, I'm always kind of client led. So we, we have a discussion about what we want to be tackling, but if, if I'm giving my input structure is one of the most important things to just get some stabilization to have this regularity of things coming in. And yes, you are already pretty regular and regimented and rigid in the way you're doing, but I think that is different to having a, a structure where the structure is actually about supporting physical health and supporting mental health as opposed to just rigid rules that are kind of pushing you further away from those things. Yeah, I love that description. I love how you described that. I think it's perfect. And I think one of the other benefits of having that structure that really does support you through recovery is it does open up opportunities to also challenge and break down a lot of the fears and beliefs about food that are holding you back from eating adequately and flexibly and and eating in a way that, you know, is more peaceful. And, and, and that's exactly, you know, what came up for me. So if I'm going to eat regularly, I'm challenging a lot of food rules as I do that. And so, as I mentioned, being able to do that for myself, but also doing this for clients to be able to unpack a lot of those fears and something that was very helpful for me because I had a mind that was so apt to judge a food as right or wrong or good or bad or healthy or unhealthy or clean or dirty, which is very dichotomous, all or nothing thinking. And so something that was really helpful for me as I had that support and needed to eat more regularly, what was really helpful is to recognize that I no longer cared if that food was right or wrong or good or bad. I didn't want to live that way anymore. Whether like the question of whether that food was healthy or unhealthy came irrelevant because it wasn't helpful to me anymore. It wasn't helpful to recovery. It wasn't helpful to my goals. If I wanted to be able to travel with my family without worrying about food, then I needed to be able to eat in a way that was flexible enough to do that. And so as meals would come up and I'd be worried about X, Y, or Z that I was eating, it was easier for me to challenge those fears because I wasn't trying to play the right or wrong game. Yeah. Instead, I was recognizing, are these thoughts truly helpful to me? Are they getting me where I want to go? Are they helping me meet my goals in recovery? And that was another aspect that of, of what I helped myself with that I think is very helpful to clients as well. Definitely, because when I'm thinking about this from what you've described with your digestive issues being a lot of the driver for you starting to do elimination diets and take out this food and that food is that when you're doing that in the reverse order and you're bringing foods back in digestion doesn't magically get it better overnight and and in some instances will get worse to start with before it gets better and so if there's this hyper focus still on is this the right food is this the wrong food um that kind of paying attention can really scuffer your ability to to get past that difficult middle phase. And so for you being able to say, look, I'm attaching this to, to my values. I'm taking a much sort of broader, bigger picture approach to this and I'm playing the long game. It kind of gets you out of the weeds and allows you to, to be able to make a lot of those changes and, and to keep going with it. Ah, oh, yes, 100%. I love how you describe that because I think you make an excellent point here in that so a lot of times, especially when we talk about like, for example, intuitive eating being a goal to, you know, a non-diet approach and, and, and emphasizing intuitive eating and really listening to your body. I feel like I was hyper-focused on my body. I was hyper-focused on every little sensation I had. And it, you know, since I've been recovered from orthorexia, I've done a lot of digging into the research on orthorexia and it is, uh, has been associated with symptom somatic disorder. 
Yeah. And I think that that was very uh, healing on a new level, even far into recovery to realize that so much of what I was doing was hyper fixation on what my body was saying or what it was feeling. And I had to let go of that. So for example, like you brought up the digestive symptoms, I really had to push through what I felt was discomfort to recognize that I can't go back to restriction. So what am I going to do? Cut out this food because it's causing my digestive issues because I didn't have any better digestion when I wasn't eating it. Yeah. Right. It was still a mess. And so exactly getting out of the weeds to recognize, no, I've got long-term goals here. I'm working towards something. And luckily, I mean, I, I very much, would suggest that an all foods fit all all foods fit mentality is one of the best things we can do for our digestion. Our digestion loves variety. It loves flexibility. I think it functions better in this middle ground and not at extremes. And that's what I found. I really hoped at the time of recovery that if I kept pushing forward and found something that was more flexible and was more moderate and wasn't so extreme that my digestion would find that same place. And it did. I didn't know that there was a lot of just trust that I had to put into that. Um, but I knew that I couldn't go the other way. Like that wasn't the answer. Right. And so the fact that I walked down that road and knew it was a dead end really did help me realize I don't want to go back there. I have nowhere to go, but forward. Yeah. And look, just, just as a caveat, when I'm working on this stuff with clients, like I don't completely throw symptoms out and say, let's just focus only on the long term. And so if someone is eating something and every time they eat it, they're like doubled over in pain or they're getting explosive diarrhea. Like it's probably okay to put that food to the side for now and we'll come back and try it again in a little while. So it's not uh, that all of the information and the feedback that you get kind of gets ignored, but it's more kind of thinking about things, bigger picture and, and realizing that some level of discomfort or some level of symptoms worsening are going to occur as part of this. And it's not that like just the tiniest little thing should make you go back to what you were doing before. Yeah. That's a great way of explaining the nuance there. Yeah. Always, always nuance in that. Yeah. And I know from, from reading your, your blog, um, that, sort of adoption, um, and I think it was adoption of your third child was something that really helped as part of this. So can you talk a little about that? Oh, sure. I'd love to. Yeah. So our, as I mentioned, I was pregnant with our first child during my internship, which was actually a really big surprise. I, I've had infertility issues for a lot of my life. I should say menstrual irregularities that turned into infertility issues when I started having kids. Um, so he was a big surprise and we went through five failed infertility treatments in between our first and our second children. Our second child is adopted here domestically in the States. He was a domestic adoption and he came to us right around where things started escalating into something in, into an eating disorder that was around that same timeline. Um, and then recovery happened and I made it to a place that I would describe as, um, halfway recovery. Like I, I had made so much progress. I was definitely in a much better place physically, mentally, and emotionally, but I still was a restrained eater. I guess I would describe it that way. It wasn't full recovery. And I knew that I knew in my heart of hearts, like I could still push through a lot of the fears that I had and a lot of, um, the restrictive eating that was still happening and the, and the, you know, mental gymnastics and the, and still kind of tracking in some way mentally, I was still doing that. And I knew that I could push, I could push through that. And so we had these two, we had these two sons and we started thinking about a third adoption, but I knew that I just really wasn't in a place to take on a third child. And that was very good for me. It was good for me to have that realization that I was not in a place, still was not in a place where I could 
continue to move forward with life in a way that I wanted to, like having another child or taking on new adventures and responsibilities or anything else. You know, life changes felt too big at the time. And that was because I was still somewhat struggling with food, um, although much better than it used to be. And so that was very eye-opening. And because of that, I didn't feel ready to have a child then. Uh, so we did decided to pursue an international adoption that we had been told would be at least two or three years before we would be able to bring her home. And that felt good. It felt good to have some time. It felt good to have this goal to work towards that I was really saying, I want full recovery by then. I want to be in a place where I could say, you know what? I really feel like I'm fully recovered because I do feel, I do actually believe in full recovery. I think that there's some stipulations there. I think full recovery comes with healthy boundaries, right? Full recovery means that I don't go on clean eating plans because I know my vulnerabilities, but mm -hmm. in a place where I feel fully recovered with healthy boundaries. So I wanted that for myself. And so that became almost a timeline for me. We started paperwork, we started the process and, and I did the work that I needed to do in order to bring her home and feel like I was physically, mentally, and emotionally ready for the challenge of bringing home a two and a half year old who didn't speak English yeah. and would need a lot of attention. And so it was good to have that timeline. And I'm proud, honestly, very proud to say that I was able to do that. And we went to Korea actually twice at the end of the adoption to first have our court hearing and meet her. And then we went back six weeks later to bring her home. And we, uh, I think, I, I love this story and I love sharing it because I think it's exactly what I was hoping for, for myself and for her, when I, we brought her home, we'd had this, we only had, uh, like six days notice when they told her that we told us that we could go back and get her. So we had to take whatever flights we could get. They were non-connecting flights. It was a, both there and back were long travel days. And so we, uh, had like a 28 day travel day from Seoul back to Southern Utah, where we were, where we were living at the time when we brought her home. And so by the time we landed in Las Vegas, which is two hours away from where we were currently living in Southern Utah, um, when we landed in Las Vegas, we, it was about 1 AM and I was so hungry. And I said to my husband, let's go through in and out drive through and, and, and grab something to eat. So we did, we grabbed something to eat. We ate it in our car at 1 a.m. And I shared French fries and a hamburger with our new daughter with no reservations, all confidence, all trust, all respect for my body. And it felt like things had come full circle. I remember sitting there just feeling so glad that I was in this place where I was really ready to take on this new challenge because I had taken care of myself and gotten to that healthy place. Wow. That is such an amazing story, which is why I asked you to share it. Cause I think it's, yeah, such a, a great end and maybe end isn't the right word, but a, a, a really good uh, point to kind of signal where you were, where you're at in terms of your, your journey with this. Yeah. Thanks. And so the other part with mentioning this as well, as I know as part of your story, there is obviously there's been adoption. So there's been infertility as part of that. And so I know for me, working with clients, I work a lot with uh, hypothalamic amenorrhea. And so for you, was there thoughts around the infertility is connected to the things that I've been doing in terms of my eating and my exercise or because there was this pre-existing condition that you knew about with your fertility that didn't get into it? So yeah, just, I guess, getting a sense of like how the infertility was for you. That's a great question. So when we, like I mentioned before, our first and second son, we had five failed infertility treatments. My infertility issues did predate my eating disorder. Um, however, I, because that first pregnancy was such a surprise, I think that is a testament to the fact that I was eating 
I, I had a much healthier relationship with food, my body and exercise at the time. So it created the opportunity for that pregnancy to happen. And so between the first and second son, we had five failed infertility treatments. It is a period of my life that I would never want to repeat. It, I swore off infertility treatments from then on out. I'm sure others' experiences are different, which I totally respect and understand. Yeah. This had really negative experiences with infertility treatments, clearly because they were not successful and it was physically, mentally, emotionally, and financially draining on us. And, um, I think back to that period of time. And I actually think that that was one thing that fueled that perfect eating of needing to control me. Uh, I couldn't control getting pregnant, but I could control how I was eating and I could control my body and I could control exercise. And there was part of me that felt like if I was more in control of what I was eating, would that help my fertility chances? Again, not really connecting the dots to not eating enough and that impact negatively impacting fertility. Clearly the, these years of disordered eating and an eating disorder did nothing to support my chances of getting pregnant. And that's something that I've had to really work through and grieve and forgive myself for. Because if you'd asked me during those years, the thing I wanted most was to be able to be pregnant. I think this is a really good example of the eating disorder hijacking my values. If yeah. I was able to think more clearly without the eating disorder, I probably could have put myself in a better position to realize what my actual goal was rather than control. My goal wasn't control. That was the eating disorders goal, right? My goal was to be able to get pregnant. And I've had to really grieve that and forgive myself and recognize that if I had the chance to go back and change that, would I? I, I wouldn't because you know, beauty from ashes. We brought two kids home through adoption, maybe because I wasn't in a position to get pregnant because of my eating issues. Um, so it created opportunities. And so I really had to regret, but also be grateful for those years that, that brought two kids into my life that maybe wouldn't have come otherwise. So yeah. everything happens for a reason, I'm sure. Uh, but then into recovery after we brought our daughter home, um, I actually found out I was pregnant six months later <laughs> after we brought her home. And it was a total surprise pregnancy. And he's now two and a half. And that was so validating for me because as I had discussed, I was kind of in this partial recovery place in limbo for a bit where things had drastically improved and I was so much better and could function from day to day so much easier but still, still uh, somewhat stressed about food, really aiming for full recovery with bringing our daughter home and then finding out I was, six, I was pregnant six months later, it was very validating to know that all of that work I had done had put my body in a position to function in the way that it needed to function. Yeah. And so any question in my mind of, you know, am I taking care of myself well enough or am I at the right weight for myself or any of the questions that I had were really put to rest at that time. And I consider that a recovery win and a recovery blessing that it really did feel like icing on the cake in, in a lot of ways, just because of our history with infertility and my food issues and all of it kind of happening at the same time. I felt like I was able to make peace with both of those things that had been such huge sources of trauma for me, both infertility and an eating disorder, it really felt like I was able to shut that door on both of them and really kind of make peace with it. Yeah, nice. And it reminds me, I was uh, speaking to a client last week and, and we were having a conversation and, uh, around is she eating healthy? Is she doing things that are really supporting her body? And I was like, well, what, what, what do you think's going on? How, how do you think things are working out? And this is someone who is, who's very much uh, far along in, in their recovery journey. And she's like, this is the healthiest I've been in, in years. And like things are functioning really well. And, and I think a lot of her questioning was stemming from the, ideas of what we have in our mind about what constitutes healthy or unhealthy food and it, there's really kind of simplified version of what we should eat and we shouldn't eat and when we match up what she's doing with that 
No, it doesn't match up exactly how people would talk about as a healthy diet. But in terms of the results and how she's feeling, it is clearly working for her. And uh, that was the, the conversation we had. And it was really nice for her to be able to make that realization that it doesn't matter what if your eating looks Instagrammable. It matters much more about how that is then impacting on all of the various functions within your body. And, and um, for her, it was, it was clearly working the same way as it was for you in that maybe your orthorexic brain was telling you what you were doing uh, wasn't the right thing to do, but clearly it was supportive because you were then able to get pregnant. Yeah, that's amazing. I think that's such a great um, way to gauge progress in recovery is to truly be able to redefine health in new ways, right? To be yeah. able to, like for this client, and even the ability to be able to decide for herself, like, yes, I am in a place where I feel the healthiest I've ever been. And to say that with confidence and trust that that's true, uh, because we often are always looking over our shoulder, whether eating disorder or not, just culturally, it's so easy for us to always look over our shoulder and wonder if we're doing the right thing. Um, and I think that's a gift that recovery can give you. I think that that's something that someone with an eating disorder who works so hard at recovery is able to be able, is able to do because of that struggle to truly be able to not have to look over their shoulder anymore because yeah. they've walked down that road and they're not going back. They know for themselves that they get to be the one that decides what's healthy and what's not for them. Not the like Instagrammable. I love that word, right? not the Instagrammable version of health, but what's truly feels supportive of me and my life. I love that. Yeah. And for you, I know you've written a lot now on your, on your blog about your journey and, and all the things that occurred as part of that. How was it pressing publish on, on the first post? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, I actually often say that I started blogging for selfish reasons. <laughs> I think that blogging wasn't actually to help any other anyone else, although I, it was great if it did. To start with, though, it was a way for me to make sense of my story. And that's something that I took from Brene Brown. I'm sure listeners are very familiar with Brene Brown, but she, yeah. her work was very helpful for me in recovery. That's one of the things that she talked about is owning your own story and really being able to describe it and talk about it. And, and so in the middle of all that was going on, writing and blogging really helped me make sense of it, really helped me get it out of my head and put it down on paper and to be, and to have to publish it, it had to make some sense, right? I had to be able to make sense of what was going on and describe it so that I could understand it and readers could understand it. So quite honestly, blogging for me was selfish. So maybe it was easier. <laughs> maybe like my young, naive self, it was easier to push publish because it, I knew that it was mostly for me that I was blogging and I was sharing my story because I wanted to truly own it. I didn't want to be ashamed of it. I didn't want to be confused by it. I wanted to truly understand and own it. And that was one of the ways I did it. And clearly the, the blog has evolved a lot since then, but man, those early days were so therapeutic for me. And in the early days of the blog, was, the, was it then connected to your, um, your, your private practice? Because I, I guess when you're talking about this, my sense would be maybe there was a fear of if I'm talking about these things and I'm then meant to be a, a registered dietitian. Is this going to drive clients away? Is like, I, I know you talked about before in terms of the shame of, well, I don't want to get a dietitian to help me out because I should know this stuff. So just, yeah, was there ambivalence around, well, I, if, I, if I share this, people aren't going to want to trust me in, in what I do? Yeah, that's a great question. I, well, at first, you know, my private practice, I was very careful about the kind of clients that I took on. So I didn't take on any eating disorders while I myself was struggling with an eating disorder. I was very careful about the clients that I took on. So I think that helped me feel better about what I was sharing because uh, I knew that I needed to get to a healthier place before I was able to take on more acute, acute care clients. Um, so I think that was helpful at first as well. I think the other part of it was 
uh, very much the work I did with my therapist was unpacking my perfectionism and allowing myself to be more more vulnerable. That's something that I, that has stemmed my whole life. You know, valedictorian, perfect grades, perfect student, front row student in every class, intern of the year in my internship. Like I've always been perfect at everything, and I've always. Um, I've never really never allowed myself to be human and struggle. And so I think part of sharing my story was to try to dispel that shame that I did feel about struggling with food. Yeah. And I, I definitely recognized that maybe it would mean that others didn't feel like I was the one to help them. But I knew that priority number one was to get to a place where I was able to truly be an effective clinician. In order to do that, I needed to be imperfect and I needed to know that it was okay to struggle on my own. And through my struggles, I actually think that I'm um, a better clinician because of my experiences, not, you know, in spite of them. Yep. And so I think, I think I had, a fair amount of clarity at the time to know that there, that this would lead somewhere good for myself and for my clients, even if it meant risking that clients wouldn't feel like I was in a place to truly help them at the time, which I totally respected. Um, but part, but as part of my own individual healing, I felt like it was necessary to talk about another big reason that I did blog was because I did start out in my career as encouraging food restriction, encouraging food fears, encouraging a lot of the things that now I discourage, right? And yep. I had promised myself, you know, if I find a way out of this, if I, if I ever recover from this eating disorder, I'm going to be part of the, the solution, not part of the problem. And so a lot of what I hoped to share on the blog was to pay penance for that, to, you know, right my wrongs, so to speak, to be able to talk about what I was struggling with, not because, not only because I was sharing my story, but also to recognize that all of the things that I had been saying had been harmful, not only to, to others, but to myself. And that was good for me because I was a, a practicing registered dietitian at the time that I had an eating disorder. And it would be, it would be incredibly naive to suggest that that didn't influence how I treated others, whether it was at this weight loss resort I was at or in my early days of private practice. I, and I felt the need to really describe the changes that I was making to not only the way I approach food, but also to my treatment philosophies overall as a way to truly transition away from how I had been talking and uh, thinking about food. Yeah. And I know you, there might feel like there's this extra penance to pay because of having the eating disorder and how that maybe steered some of your recommendations. But I would say just being a novice and being inexperienced does that as well. Like if I go back and, and read some of the things that I wrote 10 years ago or think about the way that I thought about things, like there's lots of garbage <laughs> it, we, like amongst that. Like there, that I think is just the process that you go through as you evolve and you learn more and you become more experienced and, and not just in a, in a clinical or um, scientific understanding side of things, but how to be a better practitioner how to be in a room better with someone how to hold space how to create space for someone like all of those things are learnable skills but they're learnable skills that take time and I don't think there is any sort of shortcutting that and so I think all of us who are practitioners in this field if you reflect upon where you started out and where you are now, if, if there isn't some level of cringing or wishing you could have done something a little differently, if you'd known better, that's probably more worrying. Like that, that's probably indicating that there, there hasn't been enough development over the years. Oh, I love that perspective. Absolutely. And I would imagine that anyone listening, like you want to have a practitioner that's willing to admit that they've been wrong or willing to admit that they don't know everything and are continually learning, right? And that sometimes I think we forget that 
professionals are human too, right? And allowing our own humanness to show up there, I think is good for everyone. Yeah. And I think that humanness, I mean, you, you made reference before in terms of having a great therapeutic relationship with uh, your therapist. And I, and I think that goes such a long way and is in some senses the most important thing in, in helping people is having that good relationship and, and a relationship of like, okay, we're, we're going to figure this out together. Um, and, and that's, f- from my perspective, if, if I could go and do things um, over or do things differently, it would be putting more of a focus on that in the early days and, and realizing how important that was as opposed to reading all the nutrition books. Yeah, that's a great point. And something that has helped me many times over the years when I wonder if I'm doing enough for a client to first prioritize the client practitioner relationship, not so much of coming in to fix or coming in to heal or coming in to, but creating that relationship. And I appreciate you bringing that back up because that's very much what I felt like that there, my therapist was able to do for me. I always felt understood by her. I think she did understand me a lot, quite a lot. Actually, she made lots of comments about how she had had similar concerns or similar struggles with perfectionism. And it was very validating to hear that. And I don't know that that's always necessary for you to have had the same life experiences by any means. Um, But just that as an example of how she was willing to be human in our session, she was willing to, and it was helpful for me because I, I think that that's something that I have learned over the years as I'm sure you have Chris as well, is that it's okay to be human in sessions. You don't have to be a robot. You don't have to completely ignore yourself, right? And in fact, by bringing your whole self to those sessions, it's, there's like a new layer of healing that could happen for the client. I love that point. Yeah, no, I I don't think it's just okay. Like I I actually think it is necessary. Like I, I don't think that you can operate from a place where I'm up on a pedestal and you're down there and I'm being the one that's giving you the advice like that doesn't really work or it might work but it it works only so long as the relationship continues on and Mm -hmm. once that stops then someone isn't helped and it's it's kind of often the failings with inpatient facilities is there's this really uh, this real power dynamic that is skewed where someone comes in and they are this seen as this feeble person who can't look after themselves and we need to make all these recommendations that are forced upon them to get them to, to behave and get them to a better place and the person then typically will follow or there, there can be some resistance but maybe in the end they follow the, the recommendations but it's always following recommendations as opposed to it coming from within them and them sort of learning how to make the choices and the decisions. And, and, and so I I feel that that's then just not in service of someone longer, longer term. And so, yeah, I I think the humanness aspect of it and bringing it down so that you are two equals who are are trying to figure out a, a common a common struggle or a common goal um, is is really the path forward. Uh, I love that point. That's an excellent point. And I think you bring up something really great about treatment facilities. I don't think this is true for all of them, but I have had uh, a lot of uh, clients who have had some major trauma from inpatient treatment because of that very dynamic of feeling like they weren't empowered that they just had to do it because someone was telling them to do it um, versus having a relationship with their provider. Yeah. And so what about with your, with your kids through all of this in terms of feeding your, your children? Like how, how is that when you were struggling with orthorexia and how is that now? That's a, that's a great question. I, I think that I mentioned earlier about uh, my rock bottom moments and how I needed quite a few of them because I'm stubborn. And one of my rock bottom moments was realizing the effect that the, my eating had was having on my kids. 
of course, you know, if I'm in a mindset of controlling food for myself, it would naturally carry over that I would want to control food for my kids. I was, you know, the gatekeeper, quote unquote, of, of food. I was the one preparing it. I was the one providing it. And so it was a, a natural overflow of a lot of my own struggles. And, and I, they, I remember when day we came home one Sunday, we came home from church and my son had been given a Kit Kat bar from his uh, Sunday school teacher. And he, I, I said, you know, let's go home and have lunch first. Let's not have that right now. And he came home and he said he was going to go down to his room and change his clothes and he hadn't come back up. So I went down to find him and he was sitting in the corner eating this Kit Kat like just as fast as he could before I saw. And that was one of the really rock bottom moments where I realized that I'm actually encouraging the kind of behaviors that I really don't want my kids to have. I don't want them to eat in secret. I don't want them to have to shamefully eat something. I don't want them to have to hurry up and eat something before I see it. And that was exactly what I was watching. So that was one of those times where uh, again, helped me see that I wasn't um, being the kind of mom that I wanted to be, whether it was food or otherwise. It was just kind of an eye-opening moment for me. Um, I'm, I'm glad to say that, you know, as I healed my relationship with food by association, they became much more trusting of me with food and being able to eat Kit Kats in front of me and, and being able to navigate food in just more flexible ways. Um, I do think that I've had to have more straightforward conversations with my oldest who, you know, was probably at this time five or six at the time of the Kit Kat incident. And so he was older and, and I, so over the years I've had more straightforward forward conversations with him about what I was struggling with and why food used to be the way that it was and how that's changed because it wasn't. I wasn't in a healthy place and now I am. And I think that's been healing for him and me to be able to be very open and honest about that in obviously age appropriate ways. Yeah. He's gotten older. He's now almost 16. Um, and so that's been, that's been good to be able to have those straightforward conversations. My others were young enough that I don't know that it has had as much of an impact. I mean, clearly my last two, I, I you know, they didn't see any of the eating disorder and so straightforward conversations with him and just luckily being in a much better place with food to be able to raise kids in a more positive environment. And you said, obviously, you had these thoughts around food and then ostensibly or, or through that, that impacted on, on your children. But I, I wonder often what I find when talking with clients is that there's one rule for me and then there's a rule for everyone else. So they can almost be like, oh, that's okay for those people, but it's just not okay for me. So I just wonder like how much of that was part of your story and they were able to have things that maybe you weren't because that was different for them. Yeah, I think that's fair. I've definitely, you know, as I mentioned at my worst, I was down to eating five foods. By no means was I making them eat exactly what I was eating. So for sure, my rules were different. But in my mind, I was doing what needed to be done for myself. I was doing what needed to be done for them. It was too strict. It was too restrictive. There was not enough, enough trust and respect for their bodies in making food decisions. Uh, and so, yes, absolutely. The rules were different, but at the same time, I really felt like not letting them eat sugar or not letting them eat X, Y, or Z or limiting it to only so many times was helpful. I really believed that, that I was doing them a favor. If I look back, it was all filled with so much anxiety and worry that I, I recognize that that was a good sign that I was not on the right track. Um, but at the time it felt like I was doing something helpful for them. And so again, going back to this, you know, story with the Kit Kat, that was, that was a good realization that I'm not doing good. It, what I was doing was not helping them and yeah. helped me kind of see another side of the story. 
So now, you know, we all eat the same. I eat the same things my kids do. They eat the same things I do, obviously within reason, because food preferences are different and that's normal. Um, and man, it's just a lot easier to feed myself and a lot easier to feed them. And so great that they can see me eating the same things that they are. I remember as I started recovery, I remember my oldest seeing me eat pizza for the first time and being like, you never eat pizza. Why are you eating pizza? Or, um, I'm so excited you're coming to dinner with us, mom. Or they just would be so excited to see these like new changes and new differences or, oh my gosh, mom's eating ice cream. That never happens. And, and that was very rewarding and kept me wanting to, wanting to heal and wanting to recover. Yeah. And also I'd imagine uh, a good reminder of oh, I didn't, maybe I didn't realize they were noticing this as much or, okay, th this really proves the point of like how bad things would be if this is the comments that they're now making. Yeah, yeah, because no kid should have to worry about if their mom's going to eat X, Y, or Z at dinner, right? That shouldn't even, mm -hmm. I, in my opinion and expertise, I would not, I don't think that that is necessary for kids to have to think about or worry about. We yeah. all just eat dinner together. And so exactly, exactly recognizing that if you're making that comment, man, it did get pretty bad yeah. <laughs> for you to have noticed. Yeah. And I do, I mean, I've got a almost three-year-old now and it is so enjoyable knowing that and we very much follow the, the Ellen Satter division of responsibility, like knowing that I put food on the table and then my job is done. <laughs> I'm not having to force someone to eat broccoli or force someone to have some chicken or anything along those lines. It's this is what there is. You can have from this whatever you want in whatever quantities you want. Um, and yeah, my job is not to force you to eat anything. I love that point. It is less stressful for everyone, including the parents, right? To yeah. use that division of responsibility of Ellen Satter's, it's a more enjoyable experience for you and less stressful. There's less overthinking, there's less worrying about if you're doing a good job feeding your kids or not. There, it's rewarding for both, for both parties, right? The kids and the parents. And I can see that in myself, how much less stressful food is in general with kids, knowing that I am just gonna do my job and I'm gonna trust them to do theirs. And it, it, the struggles happen, right? When we cross that line over into trying to control our kids as jobs. And that's exactly what I was doing and exactly what I mean by it always felt disconnecting and anxious and yeah. worrisome. And those feelings should have been feedback for me that something was off, right? I just thought that was normal. This is just a normal part of feeding kids. And so maybe this is helpful for listeners to recognize that if, if you're feeling anxious and if you're, you're feeling worried and you're always second guessing yourself with feeding your kids, it doesn't have to be that way. That's helpful feedback. Those feelings are helpful feedback that something's off. Yeah. And that it could be better. Definitely. And I also recognize that there's no way I could do this if I had real strong uh, preconceived notions of what he should be eating or any sort of orthorexic tendencies. Because uh, by, by saying that mealtimes aren't stressful, I mean, that's not completely true. There, there is always stress or can always be stress at a mealtime with a, with a three-year-old but um, or an almost three-year-old. But it works because you kind of trust the, the bigger picture principles because there were meals where we'll sit down and all that is consumed is some white rice or a couple of handfuls of grapes or just a piece of chicken and nothing else. And so if I'm putting on my like real strict nutritionist hat, I can come up with all the reasons why there should be X, Y, and Z other food that needs to be accompanying this meal and all of that, those things. But by being able to be sort of recognizing the, the longer term um, benefit of having him become a competent eater and figure this out, but B, just noticing that there'll be times where he really does want more protein and there'll be times where he really does want more uh, carbohydrates and there'll be times where he only wants to eat one or two things and there'll be times where he eats like a whole variety of things all in one meal and I think you have to be in a in a, a certain place for that to actually work. Yeah that's a really great point and I love it because it very much hits home personally 
was something that I think was very helpful in my recovery to recognize. And it, it's just that I needed to get rid of any of my own biases around food or eating patterns or weight in order to do two things. One, to feed my kids in a way that I wanted to and to truly support them in creating a healthy relationship with food in their bodies. I needed to give up those biases. I really needed to challenge them. I needed to let go of them. I, like you had said, get rid of those preconceived ideas of, of what they should eat or how they should look or just all those biases that I think is very natural for us to develop in the culture that we live in. And, and it's, and, and too, if we've been trained in nutrition and we're like you say, we put on that nutrition hat and we want to be more objective about it. I knew I needed to do that for my kids. And I also needed to do it for my clients. I, I knew, you know, it wasn't really an option for me to go back to having those biases or, or judgments about food, I needed to adopt that all foods mentality to truly be effective as a clinician, to not go into sessions biased on what should they should be doing, what they should weigh, what they should look like, what they, what eating patterns they should or shouldn't have. I needed to let go of those so I could be in that position to hold space and to look at things in different ways and to truly dig deeper and understand so I love that you brought up that point about preconceived ideas. Yeah. And for you, I mean, I know you said before that when you were first writing the blog, that eating disorder clients or patients weren't the people that you were working with. And so it, it felt safe to be writing. Was What was it like to then transition into working with, with that population? And was there a fear of, okay, this could be triggering and, and um, maybe I, I can't work with this population in the end because um, it's going to bring up too much stuff for me? I actually think that this is the safest place for me to be. <laughs> I say that maybe even somewhat selfishly. I don't think that I could practice in any other area of dietetics. I could not be a registered dietitian anywhere else. Maybe, maybe there's a few, but I, I think that in terms of my own well-being and, and my own personal views on the way that I want to approach food and body image for myself because of my history, this is a really safe place for me to be. And, and I think it has, it did need to get to that point, right? And I don't know the exact time where that switched. I think it was much more gradual process than like a flip of the switch, right? But yeah to really come to a place where, of course, my history will always influence my work, but not because I'm still struggling and feeling triggered by things that people are said, but because I understand them personally, because I have that personal experience where when they say something, I can truly say, you know, I've been there. I get that. I understand. And, and, and I, I think that makes me more effective, but I needed to get to a place where I could sit with someone and I could hold their hand and I didn't all, and nothing they said would have triggered any of my own issues. I needed to be truly healed in order to be able to lead someone else in, in the recovery process. So I think it was a gradual thing of like taking on different kinds of clients you know, some of the clients that I work with now, I would never have dreamed of work, working with in those earlier days. Um, but I feel much more confident in doing that. And, and a lot of that is not just because of my own personal recovery, but like you had mentioned before, just the, how we evolve as practitioners and we learn more and we become better at what we do. Um, yeah. I think it, was a, it was a natural progression, to be honest. But man, I feel really safe here. I feel like it's a, the only fit for me, to be honest. And because of your experience with orthorexia and obviously coming on podcasts and talking about it or writing about it, is it those clients within sort of all the various eating disorders, is it, is it orthorexia that is making up more of your client base than, than others? Um, that's probably fair to say, yes. I would say that a large percentage of my clients probably str struggle with restrictive eating patterns, orthorexia, a lot of the food fears, elimination diets being that rabbit hole into orthorexia because I talk about it so much. And so oftentimes they connect with that. Um, but I also have other clients 
um, that struggle with different kinds of eating disorders or even different kinds of disordered eating. Um, and I think that's the beauty of treating eating disorders is there's so much the same. Uh, there's so many similarities in terms of the struggles and there's so much similarities in terms of, of the therapeutic approaches that would help someone make peace with, with food in their body. Um, and of course, the way we talk about it or the struggles that we, we process and unpack might be a little bit different, but that's what I would say in terms of eating disorders. I would, in, in terms of treating eating disorders, one thing that I would offer because this comes up a lot in sessions and, and it's coming up for me right now. And so I'm going to mention it. I, I think that one of the biggest lies an eating disorder tells someone um, is that they're different or they're special or they're unique. So for example, if I get an inquiry, I, I get a fair amount of inquiries from those that are looking for a dietitian to be on their treatment team. And they'll say something like, I'm wondering if you can help me because I kind of have a unique case, or I'm wondering if you could help me because I'm not, my eating disorder is a little bit different. And I understand that everyone's situation is different and every situation is unique. And also recovery from an eating disorder, while the process could be a little different and it's not linear for anyone, there's so many similarities. And I think it's actually problematic that a lot of people who struggle with eating disorders feel like, this, this advice would, would work for everyone else, but me, I'm kind of different. My situation is different. Therefore that doesn't totally apply for to me. So I need to make sure I'm finding someone to help me that recognizes that the usual recommendations don't totally apply to me. And I think that that is a tool of the eating disorder to keep itself safe. Yeah. And I bring that up here only because while eating disorders definitely manifest in different ways and that they definitely, the, the behaviors are different, the way that you're um, uh, healing from those may be a little bit different, so much is the same. And so anyway, I just want to offer that to think about. No, I, look, I, you and I are on the exact same page on this. So interestingly, I released a podcast recently with a past client and this was one of the, the take home messages that she wanted to get people to understand is like, okay, you are, you are not unique. You are not special. Um, in terms of your eating disorder, like there, there, there are things that need to be done to, to help you get better. And I like, I agree. And, and I also think like this comes from this real kind of false siloing of this is one eating disorder. This is a different eating disorder. So like orthorexia is different to anorexia, which is different to binge eating disorder and, and creating these real false um, differences between all of these where actually at their core, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of similarity. And the reason why that can be uh, difficult is that people read one eating disorder. So they, they read all the different symptoms that are associated with anorexia and they're like, well, I, I tick some of those boxes. So yeah, definitely. Or I tick a lot of them, but there are these other things that are going on that means that that, that doesn't um, match up. And so it definitely can't be that. And then they read the, the, the list for orthorexia and they can see that, okay, there's some of these things, but not these other things. And so you get into this place where you feel like you don't match up to what are all of the descriptors. And, and so basically every eating disorder becomes an atypical eating disorder because you're not matching up in entirely with, with the descriptors. But I also think, and, and this connects to, to what you said, like this is fueled largely by the eating disorder. Like there is constantly when I'm, I'm working with clients and, and this happens a lot more in the, the early stages. And I think probably prevents people actually reaching out to start with is there's always this search for another way of recovery of like, how can I do recovery where I don't have to put on weight or how can I do recovery where I don't have to give up exercise or how can I do recovery with these other conditions that I want to be able to, to have and this sense and, and probably a false sense of that there is this alternative. I just haven't stumbled upon the website or the blog yet or the person talking about it. Um, 
I find this a lot with people sort of researching reverse dieting or all of these different things that promise people this way of being able to recover without really facing up or dealing with any of their greatest fears around putting on weight um, or having to to change things any in any drastic way. And it really just speaks so loudly to the eating sort of like, yes, this is what we've been after. This is what we're, we're wanting. And, and yeah, from my perspective, that stuff is just a mirage and it doesn't get people to where they want to, but it is, it's, um, it sells really well, or it makes people constantly have that search for what is going to be the alternative. Yeah. That's a great description of the problem. All of it, the, the different diagnostic criteria that you may not totally meet, and then all of the alternative therapies that are kind of touted as a solution that often feel like an easier road rather than the recovery road. And I realize that it's, um, you know, I know that the clients who I work with put a lot of trust in me that, and I don't take that lightly whatsoever. I realize the trust they're putting in me and saying, this is, this is what's going to work for you. But often that is exactly what's required is to reach out to professionals and let them guide you rather than, um, and letting it be a therapeutic relationship and a collaborative approach, but not necessarily feeling like you're the exception right? You're the exception to what we know works in eating disorder recovery. Yeah, definitely. So I want to find out more about the Eat Confident Collective. So this is something that, that you run. So can you, you talk about this? Oh, absolutely. We, my business partner and I, Stephanie, we have a group coaching program for women who struggle with food and their bodies. And we call it Eat Confident Collective. It's a monthly membership program where we teach on various topics relating to intuitive eating, exercise, self-care, body image, and all of the things that kind of wrap up in there. And with regular coaching each week, it's a really great, one of the reasons that we created it is first, uh, walking this road can be pretty lonely, right? So it's like swimming upstream, right? Thinking about food and your, and your body in new and different ways that you haven't been conditioned to culturally. It's often like swimming upstream. And so we wanted to create a group coaching program with a community of women who could support each other. And it's incredible to watch. It's incredible to be a part of. It's we, I know are biased, but we say it's the best group of women on the internet because it's so great to see them show up for each other and support each other. And I think that there's something actually really healing and therapeutic for an individual who is cheering someone on doing the same things that they're hoping to do. Yeah. And the other part, the other reason that we wanted to create this group coaching program is because we know that often getting help can be cost prohibitive. One-on-one sessions are an investment um, and often are necessary depending on the individual. So our group coaching program is not for someone with an active eating disorder, but it is for women who want to have support and coaching in creating a more peaceful relationship with food in their body. And it is a more affordable option. And we love to be able to provide that. And for you, are you enjoying doing it with Stephanie? I mean, I know for some people being a, an entrepreneur or a solo entrepreneur can feel lonely or can feel isolating. So is there something enjoyable that you're getting out of this being a partnership? Absolutely. Private practice is kind of like living on an island <laughs> and I love it in so many ways. Um, I love the individuality. I love the the flexibility of private practice, but there is something so rewarding in working with someone else and collaborating with someone else and bouncing ideas off someone else. And I think that the quality of what we do there is because of that, because there's two of us, because there's two different perspectives that are offered, um, because we can kind of feed off of each other and we can collaborate together in how to make it the best possible experience for our members. Um, and it is, it's, it's good to have a friend to work with sometimes. 
Nice. So look, we have covered a ton as part of this. And I want to thank you for being so open and talking about your story and for being able to share everything you know. Is there anything we didn't cover that you were hoping we'd chat about? No, I think this was a very good comprehensive view. I hope there's some really good nuggets to take away for listeners. Okay, nice. I guess my only other question is like, when do you sleep? <laughs> you've got four <laughs> kids, you've got private practice, you, you're running this other thing. Like, yeah, it, it sounds as you have a very full on life. Yeah, it is a full life. I like to say full versus busy. It's not okay. all rainbows and sunshine over here all the time. There is some obviously always growing pains and learning how everything fits together all of the time. But, you know, when people ask me this question, I often... I think it's really important to respond in and recognize that this is what recovery gave me. You know, I think for years, my eating disorder, my preoccupation with food and my body just stole so much of my life. And I have a lot of regrets around that. And maybe I'm making up for lost time. I don't know, but I feel like I have my brain and I have my values back and I have my life back. And I and I've chosen all of it. I've chosen to have four kids. I've chosen to have two businesses. I've chosen all of it. I also choose to take care of myself, so I do sleep. Um, but that that's testimony to what's possible when you're not struggling with food and weight <laughs> concern. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And I think that's a really, a really good testimony and a, a great place to end. So look, thank you so much for coming on the on the show. I really enjoyed this. Thank you for having me. So that was my conversation with Emily Fonsberg. I felt like we covered a lot and I hope that there was many things that you got out of hearing Emily's experience with orthorexia and her recovery journey with it and our discussion about eating disorders more generally. As I mentioned at the top of the show, Seven Health is now taking on new clients. If you're interested in working together or just finding out more, you can head over to seven-health.com forward slash help, so H-E-L-P. That is it for this week's show. I'll be back next week with another new episode. So stay safe and I'll catch you then.